ملخص ما جرى لي ولأخي ما الذي دفعني إلى موافقتك على كل ما حدث في البداية كنا في قلب السيارة تحت المطر الكثيف الذي تشقه إنارة الطريق الخافتة قلت لي إن أخي نائم وهو يقود السيارة لم أكن قد انتبهت وحين نظرت إليه وجدت وجدته نائما فعلا خلف المقود أوقفت السيارة وأنزلته منها وأنا أراقبك وضعته على الطريق ومددته هناك لم يستيقظ وبقي غافيا على الصورة التي وضعته بها ليبتل قميصه الأبيض خلال ثوان تحت المطر ملتصقا بعظام صدره البارزة بدا لي وأنت تضعه على الرصيف بتلك الثقة والتلقائية أن هذا هو التصرف البديهي في مثل هذه المواقف أن يتم إخراج النائم خارج السيارة ويمدد في الطريق ليتمكن الباقون من إكمال مسيرهم حتى أنني لم أذكر الموضوع أصلا ونحن صامتان نقطع الطريق الموحشة في السيارة التي استلمت قيادتها فقط خفق قلبي قليلا إذ لمع ضوء الشارع على ورقة كبيرة خضراء لشجرة بدت غامقة ولامعة بفعل المطر في هذه الصورة وألوانها يدرك المرء جوهر الليل بشكل أوضح العتمة والإحباط والمصائر المجهولة لأشخاص مثل أخي الأصغر الممدد الآن نائما في مكان ما خلفنا في الصباح كان ينبغي أن أذهب لأتفقده وأعرف ما جرى له هبطت التلة المشمسة المرصوفة بالأحجار لأصل إلى مكان عمله بدا المكان مختلفا قليلا كانت في قلبه فسحة تحوطها ستائر بيضاء بلاستيكية يجلس فيها الناس متلاصقين رأيته بينهم هناك شققت طريقي لأصل إلى المكان كان جالسا بين الآخرين مرتديا سروالا داخليا قطنيا فقط يبدو عريضا عليه كأنه لشخص آخر تمكنت من الدخول بسهولة لم أتوقعها إلى الحجرة التي علمت أنها سجن مؤقت أقيم هنا جلست بقربه عندما فكرت بالموقف وحقيقته فعلا ظننت أن قلبي سيتوقف من القهر لا أعلم بعد إن كان يعرف أنني السبب في وجوده هنا على هذا النحو كنت أريد أن أعرف ماذا يتذكر تماما عما جرى ليلة البارحة قال لي إنه استيقظ ليجد نفسه في الشارع واقتادته الشرطة إلى هنا طبعا سرقوا لي محفظتي قال بتسليم ولم يأتي على ذكر أي أوراق ثبوتية كانت معه في المحفظة أغمضت عيني ونجحت في تذكر محفظته تماما كأني أراها الآن كان يحمل فيها ثلاثة أوراق من فئة العشرة آلاف ليرة لبنانية صفراء وربما خمسة آلاف أيضا أمسكت يده البيضاء النحيلة كأيدي البنات وقلت له إنني سأعطيه نقودا أكثر مما سرق منه لقد كنت صادقة فعلا فيما قلته إذ كان من الواضح بالنسبة لي أنني أستطيع أن أسرق وأقتل لأعطيه نقودا بدل التي أضاعها كان ذلك جليا للغاية خرجت لأعرف من أحد ما كيف يمكنني أن أخرجه سألت رجلا يجلس في مكتب أمام الحجرة كما لو أنه يجلس في صدر مقهى يديرها دلني على غرفة أخرى دخلت إليها وسألت رجل شرطة عما يمكنني فعله من أجل أخي فقال أن علينا الانتظار أكثر حتى نعرف كيف نتصرف ربما إلى الغد خرجت من الغرفة لأحاول التحدث مرة أخرى إلى أخي لكن ازدحاما كان قد احتل المسافة أمام غرفة السجن مددت رأسي بين المتدافعين ولم أتمكن من رؤيته في المنزل وجدت الكثير من الناس لم أكن أريد أن ألاطفهم بعد أن عدت مطرودة من السجن ولم أرى أخي مرة ثانية كانوا يمرحون في كل حجرة مع أطباقهم وأكوابهم نظرت إلى باب الشرفة فوجدت أن الغسالة القديمة تسده وقررت أن أزيحها لأخرج وآكل لوحدي هناك أزحتها وخرجت بفنجان قهوة لأشربه قبل الغداء وأرتاح قليلا خرج وراء اثنان أو, اثنان أو ثلاثة منهم لم أستطع أن أتحمل ذلك فأنا 
يجب أن يكون لي الحق بأن أكون وحدي على الشرفة الآن وجدت نفسي أصرخ وأشتمهم ورميت الفنجان على, الفنجان على الأرض لينكسر وتركت الشرفة عائدة للداخل وأنا أوبخ نفسي قليلا لأنني تصرفت هكذا مع أناس غير مذنبين فيما حدث لي ولأخي The gist of it. What made me go along with what you wanted to do? In the beginning, we were in the car, rain lashing down so heavily that it almost drowned out the streetlight's dim glow. My brother was driving, and you pointed out to me that he was asleep. I hadn't noticed, but when I looked over at him, I saw you were right. He was actually sleeping deeply at the wheel. You stopped the car and got him out while I just watched you. You laid him down on the edge of the road and adjusted his position as if the ground were a bed. He didn't wake up. He just slumbered on right where you'd put him, his white shirt getting soaked by the rain in seconds and sticking to him, turning transparent over his bony chest. Your confident, seemingly automatic way of manoeuvring him on the pavement made the whole thing feel perfectly normal, a common sense response to the situation. Get the sleeper out of the car and lay him down on the road so the others can continue their journey. So much so that I didn't even say anything about what had just happened. We both stayed silent as you drove us away down the desolate road. The only thing that did make my heart suddenly start to race was the sight of a tree with huge green leaves burnished to a shiny black by the rain, winking the gloomy streetlight back at me. In these images and colours, one can grasp clearer than ever the intrinsic nature of night, pitch black, despair, and the unknown fates of people like my younger brother lying there right now, asleep, alone somewhere back along the road behind us. In the morning, I had to go looking for him and find out what had happened. It was clear where I should head for. I'd climb up the flagstone sunny hillside and go to his work. But I think I might have taken the wrong road, or maybe it was still his workplace, but it was somehow different nowadays. In the centre of it, I saw a space cordoned off with white plastic curtains where people were sitting all crammed tightly together, and I spotted him in among them. All around the enclosure, there were throngs of people like me trying to reach those inside, and I began pushing and shoving my way through them towards the plastic curtains. I made it. He was sitting with the others, he had nothing on except some white cotton underwear, too big for him, as if it was someone else's. I managed, with unexpected ease, to get into the enclosure I later learned had been installed as a temporary prison. I sat down near him, and when I actually focused on the truth of the situation, it was so crushing that I thought my heart would be overcome by it and just stop beating altogether. I didn't know yet whether he was aware that I was the cause of what was happening to him. I wanted to know exactly what he remembered about what had gone on the night before. He said he'd woken up to find himself in the street and that the police had brought him here. And of course they nicked my wallet, he added with resignation. And he couldn't bring to mind any identity papers he might have had in it. I closed my eyes and I could picture his wallet as clearly as if it were in front of me right now. He had three yellow Lebanese £10,000 notes in there and perhaps another £5,000 note as well. I gripped his, de his pale, delicately girlish hand and told him I would give him even more money than what he'd had stolen. And I really believed what I was saying. I felt I could definitely steal or kill to get the money to replace what he'd lost. It was absolutely clear to me that I could do it. I left the room to find out from someone how I could get him out. I asked a man who was sitting in front of the makeshift cell at a desk, looking more like a cafe boss nonchalantly propping up his counter than someone overseeing a prison, and he directed me on to another room. I went in there and asked a policeman what I could do for my brother, and he told me we'd have to wait a bit longer, perhaps until the next day. 
I left the room to go and talk to my brother again, but the space in front of the plastic curtains was very densely packed now. I craned my neck this way and that, trying to see through the jostling crowd, but I didn't manage to catch sight of him again. When I got home, there were loads of people in the house. I didn't feel like being friendly to them, or even civil, really, after having been chased away from the prison and not seeing my brother again. They were cheerfully milling about in every room of the house, cups and plates in their hands. I looked towards the balcony and saw the old washing machine was blocking the doorway, and I decided to shift it to one side so I could go out there and eat on my own. I went out onto the balcony with a cup of coffee so I could drink it before lunch and try to relax a bit. Then two or three of them came out behind me. That was absolutely infuriating. I'd moved the washing machine and gone outside, specifically so I could eat and drink by myself. I couldn't bear it. Surely I had to have the right to be alone on the balcony now that I'd been driven away from the prison and hadn't been able to see my brother again. I found myself shouting and swearing and hurling my cup to the ground, smashing it to pieces. Then I stormed back inside already rebuking myself a little as I went for having behaved that way in front of people who weren't actually to blame for what had happened to me and my brother. <laughs>